So next up, we have another exciting panel uh, about um, Project Savannah. So UNDP and MAS have teamed up on Project Savannah, creating universal ESG metrics for micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSME, globally. Together, they are developing unique legal entity uh, identifier, or LEI, and digital credentials to empower SMEs in navigating green finance and supply chain opportunities. I'm really excited about this next panel. Can Savannah be a game changer for MSMEs, especially in emerging markets? This is so important for our part of the world as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing the conversation. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our next moderator, Ayaz Mita. Global Lead, Digital Finance, and SDGs at UNDP. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. One more time. Yes, all good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to invite my panelists to actually come and join me because it feels pretty lonely on the stage right now. Uh, well, thanks for being with us today. My name is Ayaz. Uh, I was introduced before, so I'm not going to waste your time doing this. Uh, I am with UNDP, super excited to be here. We're going to be discussing Project Savannah, which is a new initiative that's launched jointly between the Monetary Authority of Singapore and uh, UNDP. I've been leading that work on our side with my teams. Uh, super excited to be here. I think it's a very interesting topic. And I don't want to talk too much about it because we have a distinguished set of panelists that are going to talk about it in much more detail and with much more refinement and knowledge than I would. But I would like to start by introducing them and ask them each one of them in a turn, in the order. So if you want to start, Kelvin. Hi, I'm Calvin. I'm a co-founder of Funding Societies. We're the largest SME financing pay and payments platform in Southeast Asia. We are currently present in five countries, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, as well as Vietnam. And we gave out about $900 million of loans last year. So green finance is quite close to our hearts and something that why, why we are at the panel today. I am Patrick Conte, the CEO for the African FinTech Network. So we are the umbrella body of FinTech associations across Africa. We have under our belt and supervision over 40 countries in Africa. Um, obviously, as part of our portfolio that we manage, I mean, there are, I mean, ESG issues are very critical in what we look at when it comes to overseeing um, the way fintechs operate in Africa. So that's why I'm in this panel. Hi, I'm Shu Tan. I work for Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation, so GLIFE. We are actually founded by the Financial Stability Board uh, as a non-for-profit Swiss organization. So we maintain also the global LEI system, which uniquely identify all legal entities on a global scale. Thank you. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Ying Fan Zhang. I'm the Director for International Public Policy and Governmental Affairs for Ant Group. I think you must have seen a lot of Ant Groups here in the, in the pavilion. And ESG is also one of our key pillars, and I'm responsible for driving this strategy in the global uh, context. Very nice to meet you all. Thanks very much. So let's dive right into the topic. Uh, we know that there's more and more pressure globally on ESG reporting. There's pressures from consumers, there's pressures from governments, there's pressures from trade partners, there's pressures from uh, financial institutions on SMEs and MSMEs to be able to report back on their sustainability related performance and the whole world is now starting to shift in that direction. But I'd really like to start maybe with you, Kelvin, because you've been doing a lot of short term lending and offering payment services to a range of MSMEs across Southeast Asia. And so what's your take today on why are we talking about this here at SFF? Why is MSME ESG reporting important? Why does it matter for them? Why does it matter for you? What are the challenges? What are the gaps? What's your perspective on it? I think it's a very big topic, but if I just break it down in a few pieces, right, that why, why ultimately MSMEs come into the limelight is because of the employment and GDP impact that it contributes to most of the economies in Southeast Asia. Having said that, you'll notice that the that while there's a ton of pressure and opportunities when it comes to, to green access or green financing as a whole, the time 
the cost benefit on when you need to incur your time, cost, or resources versus when you get a benefit of it, as well as the timing of it, is actually quite mismatched. So, for example, we'll talk about how regulators are going to implement certain uh, measures or even pressure for you to, to adopt green, or even how uh, your buyers are going to implement some requirements for you, or even when it comes to green financing, having lower cost of funding, so and so forth. What you realize is that you have to incur the cost of doing additional reporting now, be it or in terms of time uh, for that, while the actual benefit has certain level, level of time lag or even uncertainty of when would that happen. So for us, MSME, where resources and time is of, of essence and it's a matter of survival, that becomes a critical challenge. And as we see this project as meaningful and critical is because the only way for you to get SME, uh, MSMEs to be more involved in it is to reduce the cost they have to incur to, to potentially have that optionality to enjoy that benefits. So I think this project is actually very critical for MSMEs. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you want Yin Fan to add some perspective to this? Because you're also doing quite some work with MSMEs on your platform, and you're doing a lot of financing, a lot of trading, and I'm sure there's issues around sustainability that arise from all directions, uh, particularly considering the push on green finance in, in China and abroad. So would you like to add a bit more to why is it important, some of the challenges, and your sure. view? So I think SME is not just a part of our business, it's all our business. Our business is focused on SME. So you can see our name is Ant, so it's very for much for the most smaller one. And uh, uh, adding to Kevin's point on the uh, proportion of SMEs in global economy and uh, empowerment, uh, employment, one missing pillar is the, uh, they are the, also the majority proportion of the scope three emissions for many of the large corporates. And this has been you know, quite difficult for large emissioners to track how we track a credible, trackable, uh, and in an e easy and effective way. And this is the challenge. And I think this is some, somewhere I think Project Savannah can help. In terms of the pain point, I think, I think generally in three, one is the uh, taxonomy. I think traditionally, most of the taxonomy is focused on the big corporates, the listed companies, because they have disclosure requirements. But for the SMEs, traditionally they are in the marginal piece. And also SMEs are in the very complex sectors. They are in the global trade, but the complexity of global trade is also another factor to make the taxonomy for a unified global SME platform very difficult, not to mention the, 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 the sector's uh, variation itself. And in terms of the uh, accessibility, I think this is also, sometimes people will use the uh, carrot and uh, uh, stickers to, to describe it. And I think ultimately it will be a uh, business commercial feasibility for the SMEs. They are struggling in their daily you know, existence of the business operation. But uh, ultimately, the ultimate beneficiary of an ESG or sustainability environment or economic environment will be the SME themselves. And this is a very important uh, message for the SME to be aware. And the, uh, the, uh, another awareness for the uh, SMEs is not for the SMEs, but for the issuers, for the lenders. The lenders will be reluctant to release funds to the SMEs because of the track record, because of the track of the fund, because of the lack of data. And this comes where the Project Savannah can provide this trust and this uh, platform for the lenders to provide more incentives to the SMEs. And this is quite important. Thanks a lot for this. So there's obviously a range of challenges. You were talking about data accessibility, redu reduction of cost to SMEs. You were talking about taxonomies. There's a whole range of taxonomies and reporting standards and frameworks that are just emerging, but that are not yet converging. And that might not be as relevant to MSMEs as they would be to global enterprises. There's a need to actually bring that down to the MSME level. And perhaps that's a good time to turn to Patrick for a second. But I want to come to you, Sher, because at the beginning, I introduced Project Savannah as a joint MAS UNDP venture. And that was not quite true. It's a joint MAS UNDP and Glyph venture. Glyph is a core partner of this. But we want to come to how you're fitting into this picture because you're bringing actually a quite interesting angle. But Patrick, maybe to add to what's been said right now in terms of challenges around data capture, uh, access to data, and reliability of data, and so on and so forth. What's the role that FinTech can play in that space? You're leading an African FinTech network. Have you seen interesting applications and digital innovations around uh, sustainability-related data capture from FinTech platforms? Yeah, thank you. I think the challenges need not be emphasized as previous speakers have, have spoken. I mean. The, the contribution to, to economies, the employment. In Africa alone, I think there was a 2020 study by PricewaterhouseCoopers. 
I mean, Nigeria alone, they estimate contributed, they estimate contributed close to 60% GDP in 2020 in Nigeria, employing close to about 80%. And if you look at the, the, the structure, um, it's you know, a lot of sole proprietorship in the sector, few that are actually legal, I mean, uh, corporate entities, issues about data, capacity, lit illiteracy levels, infrastructure. So the, the challenges are the same. Um, but what I want to add before responding specifically is the fact that the initiative, the Savannah initiative, is a good initiative because I think Minimum is trying to solve the issue of trust that normally is, um, as, as MSMEs face, you know, trust from lenders, trust from investors, because if eventually there is a unique identifier code that can sort of track their, you know, ESG, ESG footprints, you know, it will go a long way to actually identifying SMEs and, you know, providing that, that trust cover for them eventually. But we, it has to be context specific because the challenges wise they are broad across Asia and Africa, for instance, there are unique peculiarities. You know, majority, for instance, substantial majority of MSCs in, in Africa are in the commerce space, not so much in the manufacturing space where there are emissions, for instance. So those are some of the practical challenges that the Savannah project may have to contend with. Yes, when it comes to fintech in, in Africa, there is a lot happening in the space. Um, issues about sustainability is coming to the fore, not at the main fore really, but it's gradually coming to the fore. Um, we see, especially in jurisdictions like Nigeria, um, South Africa, even in Kenya, um, there is gradual entry into that space. But what is lacking is this sort of stage start to create the awareness that ESG considerations are not just for the big ones, the big corporates, but more so because the MSCs, the, the small and medium enterprises, they carry bulk, they are the lifeblood of our economies. They are the life part of, the, of our economy. So it's, for us, we see Project Savannah as creating that awareness initially, starting to imbibe the culture that whatever you do, the footprints of the tech that you provide, the sustainable footprints are really very important over the long time. So it's happening, but it's a long haul, it's a lot to do. Thanks. I mean, there's obviously a lot of challenges ahead, and that's why it's so exciting to discuss it here. Uh, maybe I want to come back to all of you, but I'll turn to Sher for a moment. But I want to come back to all of you with your perspectives on what's the most difficult part in getting access to that data? Is it on the E side? Is it on the S side? Is it on the G side? Is it other sustainability considerations? And how does it also align with the national development priorities of different countries? Because in some countries, climate will have a very strong emphasis. In some other countries, it will be about water resource management. In some other countries, it might be about deforestation, and so on and so forth. So how do you also tailor the view to what the priority is in a particular country? But I'll come to you with that question in a second. But but sure, can you tell us a bit about GLIFE? Because obviously you're at the core of this once we start talking about data and where can we actually find that data? Where should it rest? I think you're providing a very interesting solution for that. But I'm not sure everybody also knows much about GLIFE. So if you can tell us a bit about sort of what you do and how it fits in that picture that we've just been discussing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. I think both uh, Ifana and also Dr. Patrick mentioned about uh, data accessibility. So uh, actually, from Glyph's perspective, we are also very happy to join this project because it is exactly also what we are trying to establish, which is uh, build transparency and visibility. When we talk about SMEs, I think this could even go broader than ESG. Uh, so, for example, we have done a project also with Zimbabwe, and uh, there uh, we helped also the SMEs there to get the LEI, to get their visibility, because uh, actually the LEI is a unique identifier, and it is published on our website completely for free, so all the industry, all the investors can see it. And uh, the, the data is, all is also verified. So that means we can be sure that this is a real entity. And since we have done that, actually, we indeed helped to enhance the visibility of the SME. So when the SME goes for financing, especially, you know, a lot of SMEs nowadays, they also are sitting in the scope three emission uh, of larger corporates. So in that case, in many cases, it will be cross-border or cross-sector. So uh, in that case, actually, a common standard is very important. Here, uh, from our angle, is mainly just uh, the identity of a specific entity. But uh, if you can think bigger, Probably also we need to leverage a lot of the international standards like the ISSB 
uh, which actually also correlates with a lot of national uh, regulators. So here I just want to add one more thought. I think also from the public sector side, it's very happy to see that uh, actually uh, we have the chance to participate in such a project because we th I think actually the government or the regulators, they are playing a very critical role here because uh, they have to give guidelines to the SMEs. And uh, we are also happy to see, actually, I think it was Malaysia, they also published uh, a simplified ESG disclosure guideline, especially for SMEs. I think these are all very nice initiatives, and uh, I do believe that Project Savannah could also help to achieve such a goal. Thank you. Thank you, Sher. So, you know, Project Savannah, just by way of background, we've designed a range of metrics across the E, S, and G dimensions that we think can be automatically, digitally collected about SMEs without even SMEs or MSMEs having to worry about them or think about them. But you could actually get data about utility bill payments, water consumption, fuel consumption, uh, transparency in terms of payments and financial management and so on and so forth in an automated way, including from HR systems in terms of the diversity in, in the staff and so on and so forth. So we came up with a list of metrics that will be automated, digitalized, collected quite easily, and hopefully that's a starting point that we need to be really localized in different contexts. And what I wanted to ask you, coming back to you, and in no particular order, but maybe we can start with you, is in the countries where you operate, what are the areas of focus when it comes to ESG where you feel there are the biggest gaps or the biggest priorities and the biggest challenges and where FinTech and something like Savannah could actually help collect the right type of information to support businesses and MSMEs? I think maybe I'll just make two points. One is that we, as we serve the five different emerging markets in Southeast Asia, Singapore is not an emerging one, but one, the Singapore and four other emerging markets, what we find is that where the key challenge is usually, or key focus is really on the E and the S part. Candidly, for M MSMEs, when a team is not that big, G is not the biggest of priority because, uh, because of the scale of the business by nature, right? You don't impose overly too much compliance costs for a relatively small organization. And the challenge when it comes to E is really that how do you convert some of your operational data into something that's meaningful? Because, or even how do you have a common metrics to, to target for? Because if you take a, take a step back, when we were trying to partner with uh, MUF G, uh, Dynamon in, in uh, Indonesia, towards driving sustainable green financing, we were really looking at how can we help farmers to, to replant or, or manage their working capital at areas or land areas that is not deforested. So basically, it's a, a, a qualified zones. Whereas when we're working with other players in Malaysia, the focus is that, hey, how can we improve food security? But, but, but so each of the country has kind of different focus, right? But how, the fact that there's a common measurement and hence target, that, hey, we're really talking about carbon emissions and we have a common number to target for, it makes the conversations a lot easier. I think for when it comes to S, a large, oftentimes it's really talking about financial inclusion, right? How can we help more women entrepreneurs? How can we get more financing to SMEs, so and so forth? That is a relatively more established field uh, because it's been around for a long time. But what we find that is the, cha the challenge of that is while everyone talks about this, or oh, impact funding, blah, blah, so and so forth, out of our two dozen land, institutional lenders, both locally and globally, only one gives us a discount because of our impact reporting. So everyone talk the talk, but no one actually act on it. So yes, impact, and uh, they will always talk about impact and profitability has no, no conflict and blah, blah, so and so forth. And despite the additional work and reporting you have to do, um, I'm not gonna give you value for it. And which is also what makes uh, tracking the, the willingness to give data uh, so much more harder and therefore the fact that we can actually collect automatically makes the, the whole process a lot easier and being so decisive in the whole process. So there has to be some benefits attached. Access to better financing, cheaper financing, better trade contracts, uh, perhaps even higher product prices for SMEs that are actually performing well on the ESG front because consumers will want to pay more for products and services that are more responsible. Patrick, any views on uh, localization in different countries, context, some of the challenges related to that? Yeah, I mean, just what you mentioned, I mean, I would call it a sweetener. You know, I think what the SMEs need actually is a sweetener, you know, to create that, that, that drive, you know, for them to, for them to report or you know, track what they are doing in the space. Um, as to your first question, I think the environment, the E, the e stands out as, as very challenging in most jurisdictions. Um, if you look at agri-tech, um, fintechs in the agri space, so are actually connectors, connectors between farmers, maybe markets, connectors between farmers and other value chain operators in the agricultural value chains. Um, you have instances where a farmer in a particular environment, maybe 
in cacao, maybe in coffee, you know, um, how do they clear the land, for instance? Do they burn, you know, do they just brush and allow it to, you know, degrade or is it actually through fire to actually clear the land? These are all environmental, environmental issues. So how do you actually track that if there is no, what's the incentive? Because that's the issue. What's the sweetener, really, I mean, for, for, for a fintech or a farmer in that space to really track the specific data? And I think, um, as I, in my first intro, it's important to understand in any local environment what's, what's the dominant feature. For instance, in most of Africa, general commerce is the dominant feature of the small and medium enterprises. Agriculture is there maybe 10, 15%, but general commerce, buy and sell, merchandise, traders in the streets form the bulk of the sector. So the issue is, how are matrices on ESG you know, actually tracked in the commerce sector, for instance, in Africa? You know, so there is need for also incentivize, incentivize the players in the sector, because issues about social, say number of staff, you know, issues about inclusion, diversity, governance issues, even on the governance issues, it provokes the question on the structures of the SMEs. In that report I referred to in my intro, um, for instance, in Nigeria, the report stated about 70% were sole proprietors. So how can you talk about governance when the bulk of the business is a one-man show, maybe a father and a son, a husband and a wife, a husband, wife, and a son with a cousin? So tracking those governance issues are really challenges. That's why I come back to my initial, initial intro. Um, it has to be context-specific as to what are the main variables how do you incentivize be them the fintechs or the SMEs themselves themselves in the space? So actually start identifying the data, measuring the data, let alone reporting. Because naturally they'll take us another extra burden on them. So I come back to my point. There has to be a sweetener to kickstart Project Savannah, at least to get it going over the long term. And it also has to be gradual, uh, I guess, in terms of stepping stones. And as you were saying, governance might not be the top priority. It's going to be more about environmental to start with, so that it gives MSMEs a stepping stone into this. Share some perspective from your side. You've been dealing with this with large organizations and enterprises. Now we are taking this down to the MSME level. What's your thought? What's your take on this? Yeah, I think it's actually a very... Um how to say, very specific area. And uh, I actually wanted to uh, elaborate about what uh, uh, Dr. Patrick just mentioned. I think actually it's also important to build the awareness for especially SMC, uh, SMEs to start to think, oh, okay, actually uh, on the ESG side, there are some benefits for them. Uh, actually, I think in many regions, uh, the SMEs, just, just an example, a coffee bean producer or a farmer in is Ethiopia or some other countries, they might have already been like uh, performing very well on the ESG side. It's just that they don't know that this kind of data can also be reported and there are value associated with the uh, data. So I think that's actually very important, especially I think uh, to have such a project to show that the value such data can provide to, ES, uh, to SMEs so that also these companies, they can also start to think how they can leverage their uh, uh, alternative data. But of course, the data point is another to uh, big topic. It's definitely not easy to get all this data. But that means also uh, we should also try to help these SMEs to utilize specific technologies to see how such data can be obtained from them in a very easy way. So I just want to add this. Thank you. No, but that's great. And that's where actually FinTech comes into play very nicely because you need to be able to collect those data points and generate them and bring trust in the data points, but also consistency and relevance of the data collected. So talking about African context, there's so many pay-as-you-go platforms, for instance, for access to clean energy and solar uh, home systems, for example. That's data points that could be collected into the UTC. And as much as we are trying to do this in an automated manner without any sort of capacity building on the MSME side, I think understanding and awareness building and understanding and building the capacity of MSMEs around those issues is also going to be important. And I know, Yin Fan, that you probably have some views, first of all, on, on what we've just been discussing, but you also do a lot of capacity building uh, on the SME front. So can you share some general views on just what we've been discussing so far, but also the capacity that's needed and whether you've already seen some interesting attempts at building that capacity uh, through Ant Group, of course, but also your other partnerships with uh, GDFA and other international organizations. 
you know GDFA very well, thank you. I think for Ant Group, um, I want to come back to the previous question first before I answer your first interaction. I think the first question you mentioned about localization, I think this is a very important uh, topic because on E and S and G, I think S and G are more objective and the E is more subjective. And we see the alignment on the taxonomy, you know, we have TCFD and coming towards the ISSP, and I think we see a global trend to move towards the same common uh, taxonomy, but on S and G, it is where localization matters. And for ungroup group practice, our focus still is on the E side in terms of disclosuring and the green rating. And in China, I think our capacity building is not by making you know, tutoring or make a lecture to the SME because they don't have time to do that. They are struggling with their business. The best way to do the capacity building is the carrots, is to bind our financial services, our inclusion financial services with green finance. Not to separate that, but build a bridge. And how we build that is using technology. And one of the topics you mentioned, project like Project Savannah and practice like Project Savannah is the foundation of that. A case is my bank. My bank is our virtual bank in China and only focus on the SMEs. And in 2022, we start to start with the first green rating. And how we do that? We collect two sets of data. One is the green certification. The other set of data is the correlation of the green risk and green operation data. And to collect these data is very difficult. So we start to work with the government, with the regulator, and also with the World Bank, especially in here is IFC, to come up with a China localized feasible taxonomy and build upon that, we collect two sets of data. One set of data are more on the production uh, perspective from the producers. What is your production uh, environment? What is the production material? What is your social impact? What is your social feedback? On the other side is the documentation. This is where I think G GLF is uh, coming into. It's the identification of the contract, identification of the legal entity, identification of the uh, e-commerce bill, identification of even the distributor bill. And all these are the source of data points and they can be collected and centrally calculated is a green project rating. An interesting part is we found a fact that SMEs having a higher green rating normally will have a much lower default risk. And this is true. And this has been tested in my bank. And so far by last year, 2022, because we haven't released our uh, data this year yet, but last year alone, we have provided free green SME rating for six million merchants. That's correct and provided green finance based on this green rating for more than 400,000 SMEs. They are small, but that's, in, that's ever, uh, is, is very influential. And this is the best way to build up the capacity because throughout this user journey, they experience that. And the experience is not that difficult. It's just a one click. That's a very, very inspiring story. And actually one of the points just to sort of uh, piggyback on what you've been saying is partnerships are going to be important. And you've been talking about this particular example where there's been partnerships between multiple organizations. Uh, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about partnerships. What kind of partnerships might be required? Because, so for example, there's a project in Uganda that we managed to understand the environmental responsibility of smallholder farmers. And you can bring in satellite imagery, you can bring in soil scanners, sound scrapers, all sorts of different data points and analyze them to see how responsible a farmer is. But in the end, if it has to fit in the local context, if it has to be sustainable in the long run, if it has to fit within the existing taxonomies, there will be a, a whole range of actors you need to bring together. So can you tell us a little bit about what type of partnerships you think are important? And I would also love to, and I know we haven't discussed that, but let me just abuse my role as a moderator. Um, how do you think you could partner in particular with Project Savannah? So tell us a bit about partnerships in general and how you would like to partner with Savannah. I'll start with you. I think for funding societies, we have done two attempts in terms of driving green financing, despite the fact that we're a uh, relatively small organization indeed, right? I think in each of these occasions, what we find is that there are oftentimes three parties that is involved, right? Ourselves, a bigger bank, and generally a government-linked organization uh, that provides access. Because what we find is that oftentimes when it comes to environment and social, we, for our focus is primarily on social financial inclusion side, right? That's our strength. Whereas our environment side generally is our weaker area, like what, how much do we really know about it? And that's also why oftentimes we also bring in another 
another fintech partner. So for example, we do work with another partner, fintech company called Stack to help us to convert build electricity consumption uh, utilities data into something that's more meaningful from an environmental matrix perspective so that we can see what is the ever, overall green score for these companies because we can provide financing, we can manage credit risk, but without another third party, how do we convert into, uh, into a meaningful green score or so? So we find that that partnership is natural, but at the same time, usually when it comes to sectors that are very much impacted by green um, and where it needs financial inclusion, the risk is not just on the environment side, it comes with credit risk, like what uh, I think was shared uh, by my, my peer here, whereby the, high, the better the green score, the usually the lower the default rates, right? So oftentimes the green score is bad and it's also because the, default rate, the credit risk is so equally high and therefore oftentimes we need to, link, to bring in a government agency towards either providing certain level of risk mitigants or access so that we can actually solve that at the same time. So for us as an organisation, the question is going to be how do we do this in a break-even way? So it shouldn't be just a charity because it's not going to be sustainable. At least have a path towards break even, right? Especially given that the scale and the infrastructure in Southeast Asia is not as mature and we don't have resources like uh, N and, and even um, Wave, right? So to that extent, how can we do that? And hence, for our role when it comes to Project Savannah, any similar projects is really that, how can we be a fast actor to facilitate discussions so that if I don't have the resources, at least I'll we'll put in the energy to, to align everyone and take a very targeted way of, hey, I'm not going to solve the worst problem. In Indonesia, I'm just going to solve for corn because it's six months in, t in terms of growing age rather than palm oil, which takes 10 years and it's not possible. We, are not, we do not have the right to win nor the right to solve for that problem, right? So how can we play our part in taking a very targeted area and aligning different stakeholders together? Thanks a lot for uh, entertaining my question. Uh, Patrick, how can Hi. we work together and partner together between Savannah and the whole African fintech network and the other stakeholders around it? Yeah, um, on the issue of partnership, foremost, uh, I think... Um, this is a, a sustainability issue here and it's a long-term thing. So I think the, the, the ideal approach should be partnership at the grassroots level, you know, at the community level, you know, be them fintechs or where the SMEs actually operate. Be them through cooperatives, local cooperatives, benchmark each other, share knowledge, share best practices. I think that's very important. Um, in terms of partnership with, 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 with the project itself, we provide that aggregated view of the fintech ecosystem in Africa. We have under our belt 40 country fintech associations from Kenya to Egypt to Morocco to Tunisia, Rwanda, Mauritius. So what we could do is what I'm doing here. Foremost is to start creating the awareness. The awareness that small enterprises need to start applications of their digital footprints in ESG wise. You know, the way you farm, the way you conduct commerce, how you track employment, how you employ, social inclusion issues, how many women, how many men. You know, those basics, we take them for granted. You know, so I think what we could do in terms of partnership is be that voice. That voice that will start to create the awareness. Because what is, I mean, honestly speaking, the example he painted in China, what you're doing is fantastic. But the truth is we are far from that in Africa. Even at corporate, big corporate level, issues about ESG are not that pronounced, let alone standards, let alone reporting, disclosure requirements. And now we are talking about SMEs, who are the power of the, of, of the economy. But what they are, they lack capacity, they lack knowledge, they have to be incentivized. So we could be that voice to incentivize through awareness create, creation, starting to identify the main data points that technology can then use to what? collect, measure, report. So there's a lot we could do. That's a lot. And talking about collecting, measuring, reporting, and storing somewhere, back to you, Sher. You're already a partner, so I'm not going to ask you about whether you want to stay in the partnership or not. Uh, but who else should we bring on board? Who else do we need in this sort of coalition of sorts to take this global and to really make it successful and relevant? Yeah, thank you. And the answer is, of course, we will stay. <laughs> And uh, this is actually a very, very uh, interesting project for us because uh, actually uh, our expertise is mainly on NTT identification, but uh, we do see how important it can be, especially for ESG. Uh, ESG is a kind of area uh, we can see nowadays a lot of regulation is also coming. People started to, uh, I mean, now it is a hot, hot, hot topic. I'm also trying, it's, it might not be a good metaphor, but uh, for example, cross-border payment. Uh, so when the 
payment industry also started to form, you know, compliance and everything. It's been already a long journey. But nowadays, if you look at different jurisdictions, they all have their own uh, implementation as well. And that's why now we also have some issues on the cross-border payment when it comes to compliance. But I think it's actually a good momentum for the ESG uh, field because actually people started to have the awareness and uh, that's what I want to highlight. So uh, it would be good to have collaboration on a global level, to have common standard. And I also want to highlight, uh, uh, so you can say on the incentive side, especially when we think about SME, on one hand you can use a stick, on the other hand you have the carrot. I think the important piece is how these two elements can work together, not work against each other. So on one hand, of course, the public sector, now we see more and more regulations coming. And uh, also even for SMEs, for example, in EU, there will also be some regulations. They will go down the threshold. This is coming. So the SMEs also need to get ready. But on the other hand, I think from their perspective, they would also still value more about the carrot, which also Ivan mentioned, because this is something which will help them to see the immediate value. But on the other hand, uh, their value will be passed to the larger corporates who will need to fulfill the uh, regulatory mandates. So I think in the end, uh, of course, uh, that means both the public sector and also private sector, especially investors, banks, uh, financing platforms. I think these are all very important partners. But the most important thing is to figure out how we can all work in a very organic way. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Shu. And so maybe, Yinfan, let me just change the question for you. <laughs> because she's been talking a lot about the carrot. And I've been hearing the carrot and the incentive quite a lot in the panel. And you actually have a very interesting example through Ant Forest of how do you give a carrot to individuals to make greener choices, better choices, more sustainable choices. If you reflect on that example a little bit, is there something that could be brought to the MSME space and the conversation we're having about, well, you can still talk about the partnership, but really on the carrot side for MSMEs, is there something there that we could actually try to bring to the SM MSME space? And let me basically start to uh, have a quick introduction of Unforest. It is a built-in app APP we launched in 2016. And through your daily green behavior, let's say, I take a metro to Singapore Expo instead of taxi in the morning, and that will give you a green energy point. And this green energy point will be put in your kind of, I won't say the carbon account, but the green energy account in our own system. And then once you reach to a certain point, let's say 500G for the green energy, we will, as an group, to plant a tree in the Gobi Desert in China. And we have plants, I couldn't remember how, much, uh, how many trees we planted, but it's a large... 150 million. You know that number, thank you. But that changed the behavior. That is becoming a lifestyle changing for the individuals. And this is the incentive, this is the carrot. And people are willing to share how much they contributed to that uh, uh, forest. And sometimes they even go to uh, have a visit, in a tour to the desert, uh, Gobi Desert. And once this circle starts, it kind of uh, cannot be returned. And that's something I think can be difficult in the SME arena because it's not individuals. But still, even individuals can build up their own you know, sustainable behavior, not to mention the SMEs, because they have the pressure of the financing incentive, they have the pressure from their buyers, because the buyers need to disclose their emission via the SMEs. And if right in this time, we'll provide good incentive, provide good carrots, they are very, it's, it would be very hard for them to say no. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good way of applying it, actually. So we have only a few minutes left. We'll take questions in the end, if you don't mind, if we have time, because we have a few minutes left. What I'd like to do maybe is to have a final round of comments from each one of you. And maybe, OK, let's fast forward into the future. Let's imagine in three years from now, we come back to SFF on the same stage, sitting here talking about SME, MSME, ESG disclosure. What story would you like to tell from your perspective, from your organization's perspective, not necessarily related to Project Savannah, but could be related to Savannah, but what's the story you would like to tell three years from now on MSME ESG reporting? 
think I do hope that in three years from now, just as we, just as we hope that as SME digital financing will move from alternative financing to mainstream financing, we do hope that green financing will not be called green financing, but just be called financing because it's being used across the board. Great. Yeah, I, I, I would love three years from now, I would love to come back and tell a story of we are both starting from zero, ground zero, in terms of the awareness, the knowledge, you know, across SMEs for the need for their, you know, digital footprint in terms of ESG implications being identified, that awareness, that what you do in your day-to-day -day commerce, what you do in your farms, what you do as a tech in the space, your ESG footprint, the awareness of it, I think that's the starting point. We need to start creating the awareness because this is about the long-term survival of everybody. So I would like to come back and say, three years down the line, as far as Africa goes, there's the awareness, there is the willingness to start tracking what SMEs are doing, ESG-wise, so that we start, because that's the point. From that point, we can start identifying, measuring, and reporting. Because you cannot report when actually you cannot identify and, and measure. So we want to come back and say Africa is prepared to start reporting on ESG across SMEs. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, the most important, of course, I would like to see m many, many more SMEs getting the OEIs and also can also be, uh, people can use our database to basically see all their information. Uh, I think uh, from uh, two, two perspectives, I think from a solution perspective, of course, uh, uh, I would also hope that SME will even be strongly emphasized because there are customized uh, solutions for SMEs. But from the awareness side, I would like to remove SME. So whenever we talk about ESG, we never mention about SME anymore. That means actually everyone is already on board. Yeah. Thank you. And from my perspective, I, I do agree with Kelvin. There should no a difference between green finance and inclusive finance. They should be the same after 10 years. And look back, let's say I was kind of a, a panelist in the early stage of uh, Project Savannah. What I would like to see uh, is, I think, first of all, I think Project uh, Savannah is not that prescriptive. It actually starts a program platform for everyone to talk instead of telling us what to do. And this is very important. This is what I think Project Savannah is very smart at. The positioning is very clear. And that gives room to us to, de uh, to sometimes debate, sometimes discuss. And this is a global initiative. This is not on, from a regional pra uh, practice. But from our group, we will be very happy to share our practice in China and globally. And then can have the spark with you know, uh, the rest of the world. And in, in the end, I want to say you know, uh, SMEs is SME is small, but SMEs are very powerful. So we need to be ambitious, as you know, uh, Xue mentioned. There will be no difference between SMEs and big corporate. There will be a global, green, inclusive, sustainable economy, and start from Project Samana. Thanks a lot, the power of the collective. So I think this was a great pitch for coming back in three years, all of us together. Um, we have a few minutes left. I'm not sure if we can do Q&As. Uh, but I've seen a few hands raised, and anyway, we've been breaking all the rules during this panel. I haven't asked any of the questions I was supposed to ask pretty much, so we can also, I assume, take some questions. Do we have a roaming mic, or can we use a roaming mic? There's a hand raised here first. There was one at the back over there, so maybe we can take two questions, and we can see if there's more time. And if you could direct your question to one of the panelists, if you wanted, unless it's a general one, but... Uh, hello. Thank you for this conversation. Um, my question is about the Global Legal Entity Identifier Project. Um, it is a great initiative, and definitely it is going to help bring the clarity and uh, uh, transparency. To extend it a little bit more, I'm curious to know, will it also help us to map the business owners or the ultimate business owners that will be tagged with the legal entity? And will this data be uh, open to all? Thank you. I will very briefly answer your questions. So the first uh, thing is the data is completely open and it's free for everyone to use because it, uh, we are actually a non-for-profit organization. Uh, so that being said, we do capture relationship data. Right now, it is based on financial consolidation because when we talk about beneficial owners, uh, the, def the definitions can also be different when you come to different uh, uh, jurisdictions. So, but we do work with some uh, other organizations 
for example, Open Ownership, which is also a non-for-profit organization who actually provide a lot of uh, ownership inf uh, inf information, which we are also mapped to their database. Thank you. And we have one final question there at the back uh, from the gentleman. Yes, please. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Emmerich. Thanks for a wonderful panel. Uh, I have a question on attainable outcomes. Um, I believe the UN has published uh, sustainable development goals. I believe there are 17. Do you, in terms of the, the scope, do you feel that Project Savannah is addressing the 17 of them? And are there any gaps? And what are the most challenging ones to address in terms of the data being captured and the outcome that we are trying to uh, achieve? Okay, so I'm not sure I'll have enough time and we can continue the conversation, but Project Savannah is just a starting point. So it's really about bringing sustainability, performance reporting back to something really practical, realistic, tangible for MSMEs in an area where you can collect the data points digitally. So it's really a starting point of a journey. So if you really unpack it completely, the basic starting point would be CSR, then you have ESG reporting, and then you can start transitioning towards broader SDG reporting. And so we're really starting from this. The vision is that it's going to be amplified over time, but we can talk a bit more about where the gaps are, if you would like, offline, in terms of what are the missing data points and how we might be able to capture them. Of course, some of them are going to be very difficult to capture digitally at this point in time, but we have a whole range of actors building the ecosystem, so hopefully it's going to take us there. We have a few seconds left. I would like to end this on time. Thank you very much for being with us. I would like you to please give a huge round of applause to these amazing panelists. Thank you for sharing your time, your knowledge, for your generosity, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks a lot.